Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm really delighted to be here to talk about migration as a global challenge with the particular historical lens that I want to address today. And I'm very grateful to the Center for Global Migration Studies for inviting me. So let me just give you an overview of what I'm going to try and do today. It's my belief that in order to understand the post-imperial lens on conflict-induced displacement and forced migration or refuge, we need to start with some definitions. Who is a refugee? Who is a displaced person? Who is a, an asylum seeker? So all different concepts and categories that have changed their meanings over time. Until World War II, or I should say until after World War II, when the colonial empires of the West were crumbling and coming to an end, these definitions really didn't matter. It was only with the contemporary humanitarian aid regime that started from the mid, mid 20th century that it began to matter a lot. So today what I'd like to do is to explore in this presentation whether the contemporary migration or humanitarian response to conflict and mass forced migration is an outgrowth of the imperial and colonial past or largely an abrupt disjuncture from the past. So as I said earlier, in the pre-modern era, I'm going to say in the 19th and early 20th century, borders and frontiers were fuzzy. Movement was rarely restricted in the imperial encounters with multiculturalism and ethnic diversity. And this is how the Ottoman Empire, also the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as well as the colonies uh, that were ruled by European empires operated. There was, of course, a counter-movement taking place as the nation-state was developing uh, in the 19th century. During the same historical period, we saw then a period of conflict, of mass migration, of ethnic cleansing, some ethnic genocide, and the homogenization of subjects of the new nation-states, a little bit along the line of the imagined community made so famous by Benedict Anderson. Of all the colonial and imperial encounters, the Ottoman was really uniquely challenged to consider and implement systems of refuge, of resettlement, and re-territorialization in order to address, organize, and manage the mass influx of people from its border regions into the heartland of its southern provinces. By mass influx, I'm talking about the four million people that the Ottoman Empire had to somehow manage, uh, move, integrate over a period of about 40 years. So after I uh, address some of these definitions and the contemporary system of uh, humanitarian aid and refuge, I'm going to then look back at this Ottoman legacy and see if we can then uh, consider how today's system of managing conflict and mass forced migration in the Middle East might have had roots and precedences, but also ruptures in the Ottoman past. So let's look at some of these definitions. As an anthropologist, I obviously I'm, I'm very interested in how all human beings create typologies, they create categories, they create descriptive frames for organizing their environment and also for organizing themselves and their surroundings. So the question is, who do we decide is a forced migrant and who is a voluntary migrant? Uh, who's a refugee? Um, who is a stateless person? Who is a person of concern? These are all terms that now address certain categories of people and uh, are identified by the main United Nations Agency for Refugees. But it brings to me, uh, to my mind, uh, the anthropological notion of the self and the other, uh, and the definition of the borders between the self and the other, uh, between 
one ethnicity and another ethnicity, a minority, an insider, an outsider, or as Gambin talked about, the homo sucker, the individual with bare life, who we today often define as a refugee. There are two main definitions of uh, refugees. One is the legal definition, which is addressed by the UNHCR, the UN Agency for Refugees. And this is a definition based on the individual, the person, who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside of the country of his nationality or is unable to, owing because of that fear, uh, or is unwilling to avail himself uh, of the protection of that state. But if you notice in this definition, there isn't a mention of those people fleeing, for example, gang warfare, uh, drug-related insecurity, or actually armed conflict. The second definition of uh, a refugee, and actually it's the first one that was operationalized after World War II, is the definition which I'm going to call a, an operational definition rather than a legal definition, and that is the definition which exists for the UN Relief and Works Agency, which was established in 1948, before the UNHCR was set up, specifically for Palestinian refugees. And in this case, the operational definition of a Palestine refugee was any person whose normal place of residence was Palestine during the period 1st of June 1946 and up to 15th of May 1948, who lost both home and means of livelihood as a result of the 1948 conflict. So it's a very different definition that's contextualized and has a particular history. But overall, what I'm, what I'm trying to get to here is that being a refugee or is not specifically a label for a special generalizable kind or type of person, but rather it's a descriptive rubric that includes within it a world of socioeconomic statuses, personal histories, and psychological situations. What we're learning from some parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East, but I first saw this emerge after Hurricane Katrina in the United States some years back, when the survivors of the hurricane who had lost their homes were asked what it felt like to be a refugee, and the immediate answer was shock, I'm not a refugee. This is, a, of course, what we're also hearing very much in the Middle East with many refugees from Iraq and Syria over the last 10, 15 years rejecting that particular label of refugee. Maybe we can see why. So let me now just go through the stages of the modern history of the refugee regime and the kind of common understandings we have of how uh, aid is extended to people who are fleeing conflict, starting generally with World War I. So I call the first phase of the modern sort of refugee regime, that phase set up during the uh, League of Nations between 1914 and 1939. It's an era when something called the Nansen Passport became important. In fact, it was the League of Nations uh, that uh, appointed its first High Commissioner in order to deal with the nearly half a million white Russians who had been stripped of their citizenship by Lenin in 1921 and were in Europe now without papers, stateless, unable to move, unable to go anywhere. This particular approach uh, was also then later on applied to Armenians who reached Europe and Assyrian Christians as well. So the first of the refugee uh, stages of what I'm gonna call our modern regime was the issuing of documents to allow the refugee or the forced migrant to travel, to encourage movement from the country that was issuing that document to another country to search for work and then become self-supporting and then be able to return. That was phase one. Phase two uh, was what I call the institutionalization of the modern refugee regime with the 1951 convention and uh, uh, the work 
that was involved in uh, uh, assisting more than 40 million European refugees, at least 7 million uh, commonly referred to as displaced persons in displaced persons camp, and then another 1 million who refused to be repatriated but needed to be resettled. Phase three, I've identified between the 1960s to the 1980s as the Cold War, uh, post-colonial era, the era when the US pulled out of Vietnam, when suddenly you had a large number of non-European refugees. And at this stage, refugees were often regarded as heroes, generally uh, in, uh, enacting heroic escapes from communism. The fourth phase I've identified as sort of the 1990s, I haven't given it a name, but it's an era of complex emergency, of new wars, of small wars, of fragile states, failed states, and so on, and uh, also a complexity in the nature of who is a refugee. And the fifth stage, I'll go over this in a little bit more detail, our current stage, which I say is really moving us from the late 1990s to the 21st century, it's the fortress mentality, which has emerged in Europe, blurring the lines between uh, those fleeing political persecution and those fleeing poverty, the confusion or the asylum migration nexus emerging uh, with refugees coming from afar, uh, economic refugees then becoming forced migrants, uh, mass influx, uh, of people during the civil war. So just to give a little bit more detail to recap this first era, which was particularly interesting, um, Nansen, who was a, an extraordinary figure, a Norwegian explorer, a scientist, a diplomat, a humanitarian, eventually was awarded Nobel Peace Prize for his work, was actually a champion a skier, an ice skater, and was picked on to be the League of Nations first high commissioner which he did for 10 years. He established the passport that I talked about, but it was Nansen who saw that one of the biggest problems facing refugees was this lack of international identification papers to allow them to move, to allow them to become a recognized person in law. So the Nansen passport was the first legal instrument for the international protection of refugees, but along with that, Nansen was very quick to recognize that when there's an emergency, you apply the emergency aid very quickly, which he did for the Russian famine in 1921-1922, and then you move just as quickly to, uh, into uh, an attempt to resettle or to integrate or to provide people with agency to become self-sufficient. Phase two, post-World War II, was obviously an era where many said, never again, uh, that we needed to find ethical and moral principles to abide by. And the first effort in this direction was uh, made in the young uh, United Nations when they asked the widow of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, to chair a committee to write a universal bill of rights. But Eleanor uh, and her committee decided that actually if they were to write a declaration of principles, that that would have more weight than a treaty. Their thought being that a declaration of principles might have more of an opportunity to become integrated in part of the domestic law throughout uh, the country, the member countries of the United Nations. And I just want to go to two of the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 13, everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and to return to his country. But it's Article 14 that I'm particularly interested in. Everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution. And this particular principle is the one that um, I think is being particularly challenged. The right to seek asylum, uh, perhaps not so much, but the ability to get to a place to seek asylum tends to be criminalized in this day and age. After the Universal Declaration of Human Rights had been issued, uh, most countries signed it. I've forgotten exactly, but I, I do believe that the Soviet Union and many of its satellite states re refused to sign it. I 
not sure whether it's related to Article 13, um, but that's uh, another history. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was then succeeded finally in 1951 by the establishment of the, 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 the um, Convention on the Status of Refugees, but this was largely for refugees from Eastern Europe. And it also had a time dimension in the wake of World War II. And here, the refugee, if you can think back to the Nansen era, was separated from the economic migrant. It was generally the status of protection uh, by international law for political persecution. When we move to the 1960s up to the 1980s, this is the period of the Cold War and the post-colonial era. Uh, this is an image from uh, Hungary. It was an era of armed conflict and mass forced migration in much of the former British, French, and German colonies. Uh, the Cold War was becoming quite hot. The Iron Curtain had come down. I'm sorry, this is actually Checkpoint Charlie. Um, just looking at it a bit closer. And um, still at this point, many refugees from behind the Iron Curtain was being welcomed. Uh, as they came across as individuals, they fit the UNHCR definition of a refugee perfectly. But as the US pulled out of Vietnam, a huge number of Vietnamese began to flee, a very large number of non-European refugees began to flee, and it was clear that the UN uh, 51 Convention uh, was no longer really fit for purpose, and so in 1967, you have the adoption of the 1967 Protocol, which formally extended, or I should say, removed the geographical and temporal restrictions of the Convention, so it became global and without any kind of time limit. The 1990s is the period of the, the new wars, the small wars, it's the end of the Cold War, and uh, you begin to have lots of proxy wars, fragile states, and emergencies of great complexity. Uh, just think of the Balkans. And also, as a result of these conflicts, many types of forced migrations, uh, I'm going to say a multi-hued kind of migration, where individuals were no longer fleeing a political system, but sometimes they were searching for safety and for family reunification and for security. Uh, this is uh, an image which I thought fit this era quite well of a uh, sniper fire in Sarajevo in 1992 with state security actually trying to protect uh, civilian citizens from non-state actors. And the final stage, I hope it's not the final stage, but the stage we're in, and maybe we'll have a kind of a pendulum swing someday, is what we all know is what the era of fortress Europe, uh, the fortress mentality, this uh, uh, extraordinary effort sometimes to redefine uh, asylum, to manage asylum, and to challenge some of the extensive understandings of protection. It's also an era of the rise of antipathy for forced migrants, uh, even when fleeing um, armed conflict that targets civilians, especially when it's mass influx, it's not just the individual. So we have the rise of the populist discourse, keep them out. Uh, which is actually distorting the kinds of contributions that refugees and migrants make to developed economies, and it turns the discourse into one concerned with security. Um, instead of viewing people as the victims of armed conflict, it's a tendency to view them as a security risk. You have the beginning of bilateral treaties to keep migrants out, uh, to push them away, or at least to contain them. Uh, if not on the Eastern and South Mediterranean Rim, then even further away from Europe. Let me just look at the numbers with you for a few minutes so you get a sense of how this has grown. When the UNHCR was first uh, organized, there was a sense before the Hungarian crisis that maybe it was going to remain temporary. When it was founded, it was meant to be temporary. And by the middle of the 1950s, it didn't look like there were many refugees for it to look after. So you could almost say the Hungarian crisis saved the UNHCR, but the numbers were never really very great. Even as late as 1975, you have only uh, 2.5 million people of concern. Those are not all refugees. Sometimes they're stateless. Uh, sometimes they're... Um, uh, the IDP recognition came a little bit later, but the jump 
in a very short period of time, in about 20 years, from 2 million to 27 million. Of course, has a lot to do with the new wars, the small wars, and obviously what's happening in the Balkans after the, uh, the uh, Iraqi, the Anglo, uh, the Anglo-American invasion and restructuring of Iraq. You have a big jump, so that by 2009, 36 million people of concern, and today, 59 maybe even 60 million people of concern. These people of concern, and this will justify why I'm focusing on the Middle East, I hope, nearly 50% of the people of concern or the world's actual refugees of the 22 million of the 60 are in the Middle East. I've just put up some of these figures that show that the UNHCR's estimation is that there are 5.8 million uh, refugees in the Middle East and North Africa. But of course, they leave out the 5 million plus Palestinian refugees in the region. When you add them together, you get not 26% of the world's refugees, but something closer to 50 million. So where did all this begin? Now let me take you a little bit into uh, the, the Middle East. And I'll try and make sure I don't go over time. So just, can I have a five minute signal if I... Okay, thanks. I, I don't think you really need a map of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, but I thought I would put it up here so that you would get a sense of the broad area I'm talking about. Sorry. Up until the middle of the end of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire pretty much extended uh, around the whole eastern and southern rim of the Mediterranean. The Ottoman Empire also felt that it was part of the Committee of Nations, that along with France, Britain, the Habsburg Empire, and the Russian Empire. But during this period, of course, we know we have the 19th century political project to create homogenous nation states and also extend colonial endeavors. And it's a period when the three great empires uh, eventually collapsed. But prior to that, I want to look at the particular way that the Ottoman Empire was organized. And in this case, I want to talk about the way in which the empire was organized according to three millets. These are the ethno-religious communities of the Ottoman Empire. Basically, there were three. There was a Muslim millet, which was made up of Arabs, of Kurds, of Albanians, of Turks, Kosovar. There was the Christian millet, which included Arabs, Greeks, Armenians, Serbians, Bulgarians. And there was the Jewish millet, which included, of course, the Arab Jews, the Mizrahi, also the Sephardic Jews from Spain, and the Ashkenazi. And what was interesting about the Ottoman Empire is that belonging wasn't about a physical territory, but it was about belonging to one of these ethno-religious communities, um, uh, which was a social community, and also family law, uh, laws that, that really related to the developmental cycle of the individual were managed not by the Ottoman state, but rather by the religious hierarchy of the millet that people belonged to. So what it basically meant is that individuals let's say, belonging to the Armenian millet, were not just in the area we recognize as Armenia, but they were spread out throughout the whole of the Levant and also uh, into Egypt, and the same for many of the Christian um, millets. They were spread out. They had wide social networks, wide kinship networks throughout the empire, and movement, of course, in the empire wasn't restricted. This began to be threatened uh, uh, in... Um, the 1820s, with the first of the modern nation states being carved out of the Ottoman Empire in Greece in 1832, with a lot of help from Russia uh, and also Britain, followed later on by Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, and other, other countries. With each of these new nation states being carved out, Internally, there was an effort to homogenize the population, which meant that the Muslims and often the Jews in these areas were forcibly expelled. 
So the, the, the first wave between 1853-54 to uh, 1920 included around 4 million uh, Muslims. The first I'll talk about in a minute from the Crimea, and that was then followed by uh, the Armenian death marches from 1915, uh, which included as survivors somewhere in the region of 700,000 to a million survivors, but nearly the same number is lost. In the 1920s, Albanians, Kosovars fleeing, Kurds fleeing, Assyrians fleeing, and again in the 1940s, Palestinians fleeing, uh, all into the region of the Ottoman Empire that's called Bilad Sham or Greater Syria. And then we know that in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, we had Palestinians, we had Lebanese, and then Iraqis and Syrians. Now, initially, how did the Ottoman Empire deal with numbers? The first two significant waves of forced migrants uh, that the Ottoman Empire had to deal with uh, first came out uh, from Egypt with the Albanian military officer who was sent to Egypt uh, to fill the vacuum that was left after of the very brief French occupation in 1801. Uh, and then this Albanian, Muhammad Ali, got uh, big ideas and decided to take over the whole of the southern region of the Levant, meaning greater Syria, and moved into Anatolia, so, so much so that um, by, 19, by 1840, this was called an Oriental Crisis. Hundreds of thousands of people from the region of Palestine and Greater Syria had been displaced, um, but uh, in negotiations with Great Britain, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Russia, and then later France, he was persuaded to go back to Egypt as long as he could set up hereditary rule in Egypt. So the numbers weren't great. It was a few years. People all went back. The, the second image is of Abdel Qadir al Jazairi, uh, who was the great Algerian uh, nationalist uh, fighter and spiritual leader who struggled against the French for a period of about 30 years, was eventually defeated and taken to France and kept under house arrest at um, Chateau d'Ambois. Uh, but eventually he was released and allowed to go to any place of his choice. He chose to go to Damascus taking with him 5,000 soldiers and a few, a few thousand more Algerians joined him. 10,000 people in Damascus, it wasn't a problem at that time, so there was uh, really no response or action taken by the sublime port, the equivalent of the White House in, in Constantinople. The problem became then a few years later when hundreds of thousands uh, and half a million people ended up pouring into the Ottoman Empire. What then happened? So the first huge wave was from Crimea at the end of the Crimean War, which I, I often rather facetiously describe as a war fought over the keys to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, with Russia not wanting to give the keys back to France. Uh, they didn't want the Catholics to be uh, basically in charge. They wanted it to remain Russian Orthodox, and eventually Russia was so angry that it, in, it sank the entire Turkish fleet in the middle of the Black Sea. And Britain and France became so nervous that they joined the Ottomans in war against uh, Imperial Russia. Um, although Imperial Russia didn't specifically win that war, the way these peace treaties were always organized, it was able to insist that all Muslims in the Crimea had to leave, and this group was given three months to sell up their property and move out. Another half a million Cossacks, mainly from Georgia and the Ukraine, joined them. And they moved out basically into the European part of the Ottoman Empire. Very shortly thereafter, in the 1860s, um, the Russians were able to defeat the Chechnyan leader of uh, the Muslims of the Transcaucasus, and uh, with his capture and house arrest in St. Petersburg, they were able then to push and encourage another one to two million Circassians uh, to leave the region or to convert to Russian Orthodoxy. So now we have nearly three million um, 
forced migrants, of which the estimates by some of the historical demographers suggest that one out of every four of these forced migrants died along the way. I'll say a little bit more another time about the Circassian forced migrants, um, but I focus on them now particularly because it was with these huge numbers that the sublime port decided they had to now establish some kind of a code to deal with this huge number of forced migrants. Um, they recognized there were some really specific attributes of these, of these people. The men uh, were uh, assumed to have great military prowess. They were uh, used by the Ottomans as a fighting force uh, throughout this region. And I think the Ottomans recognized that they could probably use them quite instrumentally. The women were also very well known for their beauty. Um, but this is a subject of, a, of another topic. So, how did the Ottomans deal with these huge numbers? Well, this mass influx, imagine four million people entering uh, the southern part of the empire, which had a population of 30 million. I know Germany has taken in a huge number of migrants, but just imagine the equivalent would be as if Germany had taken 10 million. How would Germany have coped? How would it have managed? Um, the important thing to say is the response of the Ottomans was not how do we stop these numbers, but how do we integrate and resettle? How do we find the most beneficial places for these people in the empire, and how do we use them to develop our underpopulated regions and our insecure regions using the military prowess of some of these numbers? You'll have to remember that this region of Bilad Sham, of the, the area that today we consider the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, parts of Iraq, uh, Palestine, etc., was an area that was underpopulated due to plague over the previous century, uh, due to drought, uh, due to malaria that had become endemic, and also this was the period of the rise of Wahhabism. And so you had farmers leaving lowlands, abandoning farms. You had an area that was really a drain on the empire, uh, was one that they couldn't tax because it wasn't sufficiently populated. So they took a, uh, an approach of establishing a code um, of trying to uh, decentralize the dispossessed as quickly as possible, to disperse them as quickly as possible to provincial cities, and also to set out the grounds for their protection and how to integrate them as new subjects of the state. So it was about integration, but not assimilation, in an empire that was renowned for its multiculturalism. These people were given land where they could farm and tax farming could be reinvigorated so that tax collection um, would rise. And they were also settled in areas where there was local warfare. So they were settled between feuding groups of Bedouin and Kurds or Druze and Bedouin, and um, also in areas that the Ottoman, probably in negotiations with the um, um, Europeans, knew that they wanted to put the Hijaz railway. So many of the settlements of these groups, including later on the Kosovo and Albanian, were in the area where the railway was going to be put. Over time, obviously, this response changed. But to begin with, the, the first code of 1967 um, actually became a commission, um, which gave people plots of land. It gave the same group of people exemption from taxation either for six years or 12 years, depending upon where they settled, and exemption from conscription obligations for the young men of the families. They were free to practice their religion. They were free also to build their settlements as they were back home. So in many parts of Syria and Jordan where the Circassians settled, you see that their villages look just like the villages uh, in the Trans-Caucasus. On top of that, in spite of these numbers, once the, the, the emergency wave was over, the Ottomans began to advertise for more immigrants from Europe, and they had quite a positive response from Hungary, Bohemia, Poland, Switzerland, Italy, and even in the US. So 
There was what appears from the outside a rather liberal and tolerant policy for forced migrants, certainly from the middle of the 19th century until uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, one example also of the kind of principles that were operationalized was the events uh, in 1849 um, as a result of the 1848-49 Hungarian uprising. Uh, nearly uh, 11,000 um, Hungarian and Polish soldiers who were, had been defeated in Transylvania fled into the Ottoman Empire and asked for asylum. They were obviously taken away in groups, much as the Circassians were, moved away from the border and instrumentally helped to integrate those who were ready to convert to Islam became uh, military officers of higher rank and so on. They, the, the, the Habsburgs asked for them to be returned. But the Ottoman response at that time was, since these soldiers have taken refuge, I'm reading this quote from the, the official um, sultan's um, speech, since these soldiers have taken refuge under the noble wings of the exalted sultan, their extradition and surrender from here will not be accorded with established tradition, but they will be taken away from the frontier and kept in a secure place. So you could almost say this was one of the first cases of a, a nation uh, practicing non refoulement I'm going to move a little bit faster here. This is just a, a, a map trying to show you the way in which the Ottomans instrumentalized the settlements. This is a settlement um, of Alain, which today is quite famous because of the Kurdish uh, population there. Raqqa, and then this is a string of Circassian, Chechen, and Dagestani settlements following, hypothetically, where the railway line would be um, but also areas of lowland which needed draining and they used this manpower very effectively. I've gone over the code. Um, obviously the code became a commission and then uh, eventually uh, a directorate around 1880. It then interacted with um, international aid agencies, uh, once the Red Cross was formed, then a Red Crescent was formed a few years later on, and permanent staff were put in place to manage the growing numbers of immigrants and refugees. I should just stop here and say that, interestingly enough, in Turkish, in Ottoman Turkish, there, there is no real distinction in the term refugee or immigrant. And so this code in many historical texts is often called the a refugee code or the immigrant code. It's about people coming into the empire. And uh, again, throughout this period, it was always the emphasis on keeping the emergency phase very short and then moving out into a long development and integration stage. So uh, there were several waves. By the time we get to the second wave of Circassians, they're directly coming into the areas of the Middle East, of Syria, Jordan, uh, Palestine, and so on. Not everybody was happy. We know that a number of the Chechen communities didn't like what they got, and so um, decided to ask the, the, the Sultan to provide them with transport to go back to the Transcaucasus. Um, but by and large, the, the refugees and the immigrants found this very quick allocation of land Often this, uh, the directorate also actually transported the immigrants to, these, to their new lands. If it was a time of year when they couldn't plant seeds, they gave them provisions to see them through the winter. And on top of that, having learned that there was some kind of speculation taking place, they placed a ban on the sale of any property they were given by the state for 20 years to make sure that the migrants stayed there. And on top of that, I mentioned earlier that the Ottomans always ruled in a very decentralized fashion. It was the local communities that had to actually manage how the refugees were integrated. 
And the local mayors in the various places then have to decide how to make these immigrants into brothers, if I can put it that way. And one document I found in Damascus shows that in uh, 1880, the uh, head of the uh, administration decided to levy one piaster charge per household per year in order to assist refugees and immigrants to settle in the local area. In today's terms, that piaster is about 10, 10 pounds. So, not a huge amount, but it seemed to be something that did the trick. This system, very elaborate, uh, I'm going to say obviously died with the creation of the new republic. It died, I'm going to say in brackets, because with the establishment of the Republic of Turkey in 1923, uh, Kemal Atatürk was determined to push and to modernize. And in order to do that, he decided that he would bypass all of the Ottoman rules and regulations that had been in place and take on the, um, uh, what he would call European style, constitution, civil laws, parliament, etc. cetera. Um, but what's quite interesting is, although he was rejecting the imperial administrative, administrative institution, there wasn't anything else to replace them. And it was at the time when Freehold Nansen had already begun to operate, and perhaps unknown to Kamal Ataturk, Freehold Nansen was actually using principles that had been in place during the Ottoman period, which is the freedom of movement, the effort to make people stand up by their own feet to find work and so on. Um, so although he um, thought he was leaving the Ottoman ideas behind, I would say actually it was coming full circle. So my final slide is just a kind of to, to review. Um, Obviously, I'm painting a more rosy picture of the Ottoman Empire, particularly after the period of reform, the Tanzimat period from around 1840 to 1875. But it's to make a point. And that point is that the Ottoman state saw the necessity of moving one from emergency to settlement development rapidly. They were very worried about protracted problems, about keeping people uh, enclosed in small places, you know, at the beginning of a crisis, people would be housed in, in mosques, in churches, in, in taquillas, in, in areas of soup kitchens, in the kind of dormitories for the traveling religious students and so on. It was very clear to the Ottomans they had to move people out. Uh, they were always worried about creating ghettos. They needed to, um, to maintain that kind of multiculturalism. This was a really important aim for them. Number two, they saw straight away that these people were potential taxpayers. They potentially were going to become farmers who would be able to pay tax and enrich the coffers of the state. So they saw very clearly the economic potential um, of these refugees or immigrants who they were advertising for. And they also saw the technological advances um, that they could uh, lend, I can put it that way, uh, to these new populations. So in areas that were underpopulated but that were swamp and marshland, they gave the, the immigrants the technology that was needed to start draining the swamps. So Ras Al Ain was one of the first areas that was drained. Um, the area around Alexandretta and Antioch was drained and repopulated. And all of the lowlands of Palestine that had been abandoned in the 100 years before were drained and Palestine farmers then began to come into the area. Previous to that, these areas were really only used by uh, pastoral nomads uh, in winter months. But it's the extraordinary uh, efforts to make sure that colonies were not formed, that there were no ghettos, that people were dispersed, that local cosmopolitanism and conviviality um, remained that I think is uh, particularly interesting uh, about the Ottoman Empire. And I would argue that what we look at in the Middle East today, um, perhaps it's a bit too strong to say rejection in their rejection of the 1951 convention and 67 protocol, is that this idea of um, the Ottoman precedent, which I'm going to call a duty-based protection, a social duty, um, was foremost. Perhaps in the Middle East also, there was the sense that 
We knew that the Palestinian crisis, with the formation of a UN conciliation committee for Palestine to try and resolve the refugee issue politically, had failed, and you had a protracted situation that's now going into the 70 years, didn't make an awful lot of sense to sign a convention that was based on rights, since already the rights of Palestinians were being ignored. I think this probably also had to play into it. But on top of that, there was also very, very clearly an understanding in the Middle East that these forced migrants were not refugees. They were being classed as guests, as temporary workers, um, in order to promote self-sufficiency in the informal market, much in the same way as we saw the Ottomans were doing before. But I, I think the notion of the social responsibility to provide asylum, that recognition of an obligation to assist, to provide hospitality, also brings with it a responsibility on those that receive that assistance to return that hospitality, to become self-sufficient, and to contribute to society. It's the establishment of a moral economy, which I think operates in the Middle East a bit more strongly than the rule of international law, and is something that, as the anthropologists in this room know, was well documented in the 1920s after World War I by Marcel Moss, one of the um, disciples of Durkheim that the moral economy could be just as strong as a capitalist economy if it's um, enacted by all parties. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I've seen already one finger coming up, so says nope. Yeah. So we can directly enter into the discussion. Sorry, I didn't want to snatch the first question. Um, I have just two short questions um, regarding what we can learn from the Ottoman experience for um, today. Um, so the main argument against the freedom of movement within the area of protection for um, refugees today is that they need to be dispersed, that uh, parallel societies or ghettos need to be avoided. So it, it seems to be very interesting that in the Ottoman Empire the combination of free movement and dispersal was, was possible to upheld and I w was wondering what did the trick there, how uh, despite the fact of free movement parallel societies could be avoided. And the second question goes to burden sharing. So uh, that's sort of the price question to solve these days within Europe, how to share if a burden it is um, uh, the burden of hosting refugees. Was there the idea of a burden that is coming in present in the Ottoman Empire and was there any mechanism in place to share it? I'll start with the second question first because I'm not sure what the first question is and then you, you can repeat that to me. I, I think what's, what I tried to show is that for the Ottomans it wasn't a burden. The Ottomans saw these populations uh, uh, instrumentally Obviously, later on, they began to look at it as a religious duty. So after Abdul Hamid II began to add the religious duty as part of it. But they saw it as um, reviving an area. You have to remember that they were losing uh, a lot of their empire in the Balkans, which, you know, at the beginning of the 1800s, held 40% of their population. So um, they didn't see it as a burden to have more manpower. Uh, and they made it uh, practicable for people who uh, wanted to come to, to settle. They didn't have much choice. Uh, they, let me how put it this way. Except for the elite of the Circassians, because you know, Circassian society is highly tribal and hierarchical and uh, very warlike in reputation. The elite of the Circassians were invited to settle in Constantinople. They didn't have much choice. It was an effort to break apart any kind of possibility that the Circassians might become a dangerous uh, counter-element within the Ottoman Empire. But your, your middle class and your serf class, because it was a, a society that had a very large agricultural I don't want to say indentured serving class, um, 
were basically sent along these areas in greater Syria to settle. They had choice, i.e. they didn't have to settle near Raqqa. They could move down towards the area on the outskirts of Damascus, and many of them did because of special conditions or further down, etc. The only group to reject the area that they were assigned were the Chechenian, who insisted on settling near Ras Al Ain. Um, and it's quite interesting because you can see how national character sometimes even tra you know, carries on over the centuries. Um, it was also many of the Chechenians who found that they settled in an area of malarial swamp, but they didn't want to be involved in the draining of those swamps. And so they were losing uh, as much population as the normal um, growth. Uh, and uh, actually, by the 1930s, the Chechen population had pretty much disappeared from, from that area of Ras Al Ain, whether they'd gone back to the Caucasus or whether they had died out. Uh, had to do also with their unwillingness to accept the suggestion of where might be an appropriate place to be. So they weren't a burden. I think that's the point I want to make. They were, they were useful politically, useful economically, useful environmentally. Um, but your first question, I didn't quite get what you were so if I um, got your last slide right, yeah. you said that one key element in how to deal with influx was that um, freedom to move within, I think it's, it's part of the first point there, uh, was granted. But at the same time, dispersal was, um, was something that was um, emphasis put on. Um, so nowadays, one of the important arguments why freedom of movement within an area of protection cannot be granted and why you would place people somewhere rather than to let them choose where to go is uh, the need to disperse them to avoid parallel societies. So I wonder how it worked together there if today this is an argument for withhold um, freedom of movement within an area of protection. Well, I mean, today there, certainly in the United Kingdom, there has been for at least 20 years an uh, effort to disperse refugees. Um, but they cannot be policed. So there is dispersal in the first instance. Uh, and during the time that you're on assistance from the government, you have to stay in those places. Once your assistance ends, you can move wherever you want. Um, and that becomes quite useful because people, again, there is a kind of multicultural element. People will move towards areas where there are other people like them. I, I should perhaps elaborate a little bit on the dispersal uh, for the Ottoman. The, there were about 50,000 Jews from the, the Pale of Settlement who also came into the Ottoman Empire. And between uh, 1880 up until, uh, I, I guess, about uh, 1904, 1905, um, the, uh, when the Zionist movement was just really coming into its fold, the, the Sultan was constantly being asked to allow Jews to come in in colonies. And there had been several colonies in Palestine in the 1840s, 1850s that were, he was very concerned about at that time because they were completely cut off from the local community and there was very bad blood between that very tight Jewish settlement in the surrounding area. And it was felt that if we can avoid that, then Jews can come into the country in small family groups, but we can't have colonies. And that same rule was being applied to, to all settlements. So there, there is a history about it, that this, this uh, important um, ideological sentiment amongst the, uh, the leadership in Constantinople at the time uh, to try and avoid ghettos, colonies, uh, because of the problems that they would create. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the presentation. There were so many interesting points, but one of the things that really jumped out at me was uh, how you said that in older understandings of uh, refugees, uh, they were considered heroic somehow. And uh, this reminds me of, for example, older Anglophone literature where people might use the term exile, which is heroic and glamorous, but somehow well, it's changed a lot since then. And you know, there could be so many like implications for how we view refugees, because a heroic person has agency which they can channel into productive things once they get to the host country. And if you have kind of a victim portrayal that invites compassion, but the agency or the potential agency is considered a bit lower, so I was wondering if you could point out to 
some factors that drove this shift in the discourse, how we kind of lost this heroic element of the under, of understanding who a refugee is or could be. Thank you. I think that could be a PhD thesis. Um, it's, uh, you, no, you're absolutely right. You know, up until, um, up until the, 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 the fall of the Berlin Wall, I would say that the individual refugee fleeing communism was a hero. So this is an ideological, you know, capitalism versus communism. Um, when, you, when you can identify the individual, I mean, we can go back to ancient Greece, you know, with um, um, the, the Odyssey, with the, the, uh, the forced migrant, um, the Prince of Tyre, you know, these are all considered heroic figures. And in literature, as you say, there's always this, uh, this heroic figure who has agency, et cetera, et cetera. I think some of what has happened, um, it was unintended, has to do with the, with the institutional, institutionalization of the humanitarian aid regime. Once you have UNHCR operating uh, and continuously have to, having to ask for money for its budget, it needs to portray the refugees in a way that will attract sympathy. So, I mean, when you think about the picture of refugees, it's almost always a child, a mother and child, a starving child. And these are the images that are used often by the aid agencies uh, to raise funds in order to provide. So you could say that the agency of the refugee has been stripped from him or her in order to garner the sympathy of donor countries, and also private individuals. Um, having said that, I would argue that what we're seeing now on the Eastern and Southern Mediterranean with first the Iraqi refugees after 2003, 2006, 2007, and Syrian refugees um, is a different image with um, a, a greater recognition that many of these refugees are middle class professionals, uh, often speaking more than one language, uh, well-educated, um, and determined somehow to find ways to become self-sufficient and also determined to return one day when conditions permit. So they're engaged in a more circular kind of migration than after World War II was often thought to be one way. Once you're a refugee, you know, you were resettled, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, uh, it's it, I think it, it is perplexing why we've turned from looking at that person who flees uh, as heroic to looking at that person who flees now as being a victim, and particularly a passive victim. Because actually the decision to flee is a hard one. Um, and of course not everybody flees in times of conflict but it's very difficult and it's often made uh, considering the safety and security of more than just the individual uh, involved. No, good PhD topic. I'm wondering how today you know this humanitarian aid regime is coping with the traditional historical traces of a moral economy in the region. So I would really like, could you define or try to figure out the traces of this historical past in the contemporary current regime in the region? Well, I think this historical past is with us all. It's part of civil society. Uh, it's the solidarity that you find in civil society. It's the, uh, what Marcel Moss wrote about. What he was showing was that we have this moral economy in all societies and we need to encourage it and develop it in the West. And I think that's what I see is happening. I don't want to sound too much of an optimist, but um, I see it particularly in the, in the Levant, in the countries surrounding Syria, where you have three million Syrians in Turkey, you have one million in Lebanon, you have 600,000 in Jordan, countries with not very large populations, trying to get international development aid to help them to make basic provisions for the Syrians. But what's emerged in what I would call a kind of a, um, not quite a vacuum, but in a, inadequate response, has been 
massive civil society organization. And often it's the middle class and wealthier Syrians and Iraqis who've somehow managed to set up businesses abroad, who have a diaspora, who are turning around and giving a great deal of aid, providing, I can name a number of Syrians who've set up foundations to give scholarships to Syrians if they can finish high school to get scholarships abroad. Um, so many um, local uh, NGOs uh, setting up activities to educate uh, in the region, uh, to help uh, raise funds to provide health care. Uh, and I see it in Europe. I, I mean, you see it in Germany. I'm beginning to even see it in England um, with a, a lot of work coming out of the local community to try and really help those Syrians who do manage to get uh, to the country. And in England, it's particularly difficult. And then I won't say any more. You know, England has rejected any quota. It won't accept Syrian refugees. It's only accepting hand-picked Syrians from the refugee camps of Jordan and from certain informal camps in uh, Lebanon and Turkey who fall under the category of Vulnerable People's Program. It means these are not your middle-class skilled professionals. These are often rural uneducated and sometimes illiterate, even in Arabic, but they have a serious problem at home and it's normally a health problem. So these people and their families are brought to the UK. These people are not gonna integrate within two years. These people need support for a very long time. And it's wonderful to see the local communities really coming forward to try and help these families because they are going to be the least able to stand on their own for a very long time. Thank you.